Chapter Fourteen of The Adventures of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Fourteen. Mister Hearty yields. God started making a man, and then sort of losing interest, he made Arty. That's what I think of your brother-in-law, Missus B. Mrs. Bindle paused in the operation of lifting an iron from the stove and holding its face to her cheek to judge as to its degree of heat. There was a note of contemptuous disgust in Bindle's voice that was new to her. "'You always was jealous of him,' she remarked, rubbing a piece of soap on the face of the iron and polishing it vigorously upon a small square of well-worn carpet kept for that purpose. "'He's got on, and you haven't, and there's an end of it.' and she brought down the iron fiercely upon a pillow-case. "'What do you think he's done now?' demanded Bindle as he went to the sink and filled the basin for his evening rinse. Plunging his face into the water, with much puffing and blowing, he began to lather it with soapy hands. He had apparently entirely forgotten his question. "'Well, what is it?' inquired Mrs. Bindle at length, too curious longer to remain quiet bindle turned from the sink soap suds forming a rim round his face and filling his tightly shut eyes he groped with hands extended towards the door behind which hung the roller towel having polished his face to his entire satisfaction he walked towards the door leading into the passage well what's he done now demanded mrs bindle again with asperity he says millikins ain't going to marry charlie dixon there was anger in bindle's voice you're a nice one commented mrs bindle always sneerin at marriage and now you're blaming mr hearty because he won't well i'm blowed bindle wheeled round his good humour reasserting itself i hadn't thought of that having cleared away her ironing mrs bindle threw the white tablecloth over the table with an angry flourish now ain't that funny continued bindle as if highly amused at mrs bindle's discovery now ain't that funny he repeated seems to amuse you she retorted acidly it does mrs b you've just it it one of the funniest things i ever come across ere's me a-tellin everybody about this chamber of horrors what we call marriage and blessed if i ain't a-tryin to shove poor old charlie dixon in and shut the door on him bindle grinned expansively supper'll be ready in five minutes said mrs bindle with indrawn lips right o cried bindle as he made for the door i'm going to get into my uniform before i ops round to see arty it's wonderful what a bit of blue cloth and a peak cap'll do with a cove like arty especially when i happens to be inside yes mrs b he repeated as he opened the door you're right it does amuse me and he closed the door softly behind him mrs bindle expressed her thoughts upon the long-suffering table appointments when bindle returned in his uniform supper was ready for some time the meal proceeded in silence funny thing he remarked at length i can swallow most things from stewed steak to half-cooked ems but arty just sticks in my gizzard you're jealous that's what you are remarked mrs bindle with conviction a man what could be jealous of arty said bindle ain't safe to be let out only on a chain why don't he try and bring a little happiness down here instead of saying it's all in heaven with you and him a-sittin on the lid makes life like an addock what's been reduced in price it does what are you going to say to mr hearty inquired mrs bindle suspiciously well remarked bindle that depends rather on what arty's going to say to me you've no right to interfere in his affairs you're quite right mrs b remarked bindle that's what makes it so pleasant i haven't got no right to punch arty's head but one of these days i know i shall do it never see an head in all my life what looked so inviting as arty's seems to be crying out to be punched it does you didn't ought to go around upsetting him said mrs bindle aggressively he's got enough troubles he's going to have another to-night mrs b and if he ain't careful he'll probably have another to-morrow night mrs bindle banged the lid on a dish you ain't against them kids a gettin married are you bindle demanded you used to be sort of fond of millikins no i'm not against it but i'm not going to interfere in mr hearty's affairs said mrs bindle virtuously well i am said bindle grimly as he rose and reached for his cap a moment later he left the room whistling cheerily at the hearty's house millie opened the door oh uncle joe she cried i wondered whether you would come course i'd come millikins said bindle now you just run and tell your father that i want to ave a little talk with him in the drawing-room 
Then you'll turn on the light and behave as if as I was a real lemonade swell. Millie smiled tremulously and led the way upstairs. Ushering Bindle into the drawing room, she switched on the light and went out, gently closing the door behind her. Five minutes later, Mr. Hearty entered. From the movement of his fingers, it was obvious that he was ill at ease. "'Hello, Artie,' said Bindle genially. "'Good evening, Joseph,' responded Mr. Hearty. "'Prayed good?' inquired Bindle conversationally. "'Quite good, thank you, Joseph,' was the response. "'Going to open any more shops?' was the next question. Mr. Hearty shook his head. Bindle sucked contentedly at his pipe. "'Won't you sit down, Artie?' he asked solicitously. Mr. Hardy sat down mechanically, then a moment later rose to his feet. "'Now, Artie said Bindle, "'you and me are going to have a little talk about Millikins.' Mr. Hardy stiffened visibly. "'I, I don't understand,' he said. "'You just wait a minute, Artie, and you'll understand a rare lot. Now are you, or are you not, going to let them kids get married?' "'Most emphatically not,' said Mr. Hardy with decision. "'Millie is too young. She's not twenty yet.' now ain't you just tiresome arty ere have i been arrangin for the weddin for next tuesday and you go and say it ain't comin arf you should have told me this before but millie only asked me this morning protested mr hearty whose literalness always placed him at a disadvantage with bindle did she really remarked bindle dear me and she knew she was going to get married last night never could understand women he remarked shaking his head hopelessly mr hearty was at a loss he had been prepared for unpleasantness, but this geniality on the part of his brother-in-law he found disarming. "'I have been forced to tell you before, Joseph,' he said with some asperity, "'that I cannot permit you to interfere in my private affairs.' "'Quite right, Artie,' agreed Bindle genially. "'Quite right. You said it in them very words.' Bindle's imperturbability caused Mr. Hardy to look at him anxiously. "'Then why do you come here to-night, and, and?' he broke off nervously. I was always like that, Artie. Never seemed able to take no for an answer. Now what are you going to give them for a wedding breakfast? he inquired. And have we got to bring our own meat tickets? I have just told you, Joseph, remarked Mr. Hardy angrily, that they are not going to be married. Now ain't that a pity, remarked Bindle, as having refilled his pipe, he proceeded to light it. Now I ain't that a pity. I been and fixed all up with Charlie Dixon, and now ere you are a upsettin of my plans. I don't like my plans upset, Arty. I don't really. Mr. Hardy looked at Bindle in amazement. This was to him a new Bindle. He had been prepared for anything but this attitude, which seemed to take everything for granted. I shouldn't make it a big wedding, Arty. There ain't time for that, and just a nice, pleasant little wedding breakfast. A cake, of course. You must have a cake. No woman don't feel she's married without a cake. She'd sooner have a cake than an husband. I tell you, Joseph, that I shall not allow Millie to marry this young man on Tuesday. I am very busy, and I must... I shouldn't go, Artie, if I was you. I shouldn't, really. I should just stop here and listen to what I have to say. I have been very patient with you for some years past, Joseph, began Mr. Hearty, and I must confess... You have, Hearty, interrupted Bindle quietly, looking at him over a flaming match. You have. If you wasn't wanted in the green grocery line, you'd have been on a monument. You're that patient. Has it ever struck you, Hearty? There was a sterner note in Bindle's voice. Has it ever struck you that sometimes coves is patient because they're afraid to knock the other cove down? i refuse to discuss such matters joseph said mr hearty with dignity well well arty perhaps you're right responded bindle least said soonest mended so them kids ain't going to get married on tuesday you say he continued calmly i thought i had made that clear mr hearty's hand shook with nervousness you have arty you have said bindle mournfully what right have you to to interfere in such matters demanded mr hearty deliberately endeavouring to work himself into a state of indignation millie shall marry when i please and her husband shall be of my choosing bindle looked at mr hearty in surprise he had never known him so determined you think because you're martha's brother-in-law mr hearty was meticulously accurate in describing the exact relationship existing between them that gives you a right to to order me about he concluded rather lamely look here arty said bindle calmly if you goes on like that you'll be ill i have been meaning to speak to you for some time past continued mr hearty gaining courage 
once and for all you must cease to interfere in my affairs if we are to to continue er brothers in the lord suggested bindle there is another thing joseph proceeded mr hearty i i have more than a suspicion that you know something about those that the mr hearty paused spit it out arty said bindle encouragingly there ain't no ladies present if if there are any more disturbances in in my neighbourhood continued mr hearty i shall put the matter in the hands of the police i i have taken legal advice as he uttered the last sentence mr hearty looked at bindle as if expecting him to quail under the implied threat have you really was bindle's sole comment i have a clue there was a woolly triumph in mr hearty's voice you don't say so said bindle with unruffled calm you better see the panel doctor and have it taken out mr hearty was disappointed at the effect of what he had hoped to prove a bombshell now joseph i must be going said mr hearty i am very busy mr hearty looked about him as if seeking something with which to be busy so millikins ain't going to be allowed to marry charlie dixon said bindle with gloomy resignation as he rose certainly not said mr hearty my mind is made up nothing wouldn't make you change it i suppose inquired bindle nothing joseph there was no trace of indecision in mr hearty's voice now poor little millikins said bindle sadly as he moved towards the door i done my best poor little millikins he repeated as he reached for the door handle mr hearty's spirits rose he wondered why he had not asserted himself before he had been very weak lamentably weak still he now knew how to act should further difficulties arise through bindle's unpardonable interference in his affairs bindle opened the door then closed it again as if he had just remembered something you was saying that you been to your lawyer arty he said i have consulted my solicitor mr hardy looked swiftly at bindle at a loss to understand the reason for the question useful sometimes knowing a lawyer remarked bindle looking intently into the bowl of his pipe suddenly he looked up into mr hearty's face you'll be wantin him soon arty what do you mean there was ill-disguised alarm in mr hearty's voice i see an old pal o yours yesterday arty said bindle as he opened the door again ratty she was with you she's goin to make trouble i'm afraid well so long arty i must be orf and bindle went out into the passage joseph called out mr hearty i want to speak to you bindle re-entered mr hardy walked round him and shut the door stealthily what do you mean joseph there was fear in mr hardy's voice and eyes bindle walked up to him and whispered something in his ear i i mr hardy stuttered and paled my god you see arty she told me all about it at the time said bindle calmly it's a lie a damned lie shouted mr hardy ush arty ush said bindle gently such language from you oh naughty arty naughty it's a lie i tell you mr hearty's voice was almost tearful it's a wicked endeavour to ruin me all you got to do arty said bindle is to go to old six and eight pence and ever up it's a lie i tell you said mr hearty weakly as he sank down upon the couch so you just said remarked bindle calmly i thought i'd better let you know she was goin up to tell the old bird on the ill women is funny things arty when you gets their goat she asked me if i'd mind her goin she says she wouldn't do anything i didn't want her to because i was the only one what stood by her made a rare fuss she did though it wasn't much i done well arty you're busy and i must be orf bindle made a movement towards the door joseph you must stop her mr hearty sprang up his eyes dilated with fear me exclaimed bindle in surprise it ain't nothing to do with me you just been tellin me i'm always a button in where i ain't wanted and now but but you must joseph pleaded mr hearty if this was to get about it would ruin me now ain't you funny arty said bindle here are you a wantin me to do what you said urt your feelings if you do this joseph i'll i'll bindle looked at mr hearty steadily i'll try he said and now i must be open tuesday i think was the date i suppose you'll be avin it at the chapel i'd like to have a word with millikins before i go i'll come into the parlour with you arty you will see began mr hearty right o replied bindle cheerfully you leave it to me mr hearty turned meekly and walked downstairs to the parlour where mrs hearty and millie were seated 
It's all right, Millikins. Your father says he don't object. I persuaded him that you're old enough to know your own mind. Millie jumped up and ran to Bindle. Oh, Uncle Joe, you darling, she cried. Yes, ain't I? That's what all the ladies tell me, Millikins. Makes your Aunt Lizzie so cross, it does. Hello, Martha, he cried. Hope you got a pretty dress for next Tuesday. A wedding, what oh? Now I must be orf. There's a rare lot of burglars in Fulham, and when they ears I'm out, Lord, they runs home like bunnies to their utches. Good night, Artie. Cheer o, Martha. Give us a kiss, Millikins. And Bindle went out, shown to the door by Millie. Oh, Uncle Joe, you're absolutely wonderful. I think you could do anything in the world, she said. I wonder, muttered Bindle as he walked off, if they'll charge me up with that little fairy tale I told Artie. End of chapter 14, read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com.